So everyone, welcome. It's so lovely to have you join us here this Wednesday evening um, for San Diego Psych Association's um, Business of Private Practice event um, put on by the Early Career Professional Committee, of which I am the chair. Hello, my name is Dr. Lindsay Elizondo. Um, really looking forward to our fabulous presenters tonight. I think this is going to be a really wonderful learning opportunity to learn from some great experts in our community um, to offer some insight on um, a topic that we tend to have no training in uh, in grad school and yet is very, very important. Um, so just a little housekeeping, um, the format, um, we're going to have um, fifth, just some brief 15 minute presentations from each of our fantastic speakers. Um, and then we really wanted to prioritize the Q&A portion. So the last hour or so will be all for Q&A. Um, with the description of the event, there was an opportunity to submit some questions ahead of time. So we're just going to uh, uh, run through some of those um, in the beginning to get questions sort of percolating. Um, but we. Um, I'm going to ask you all to hold your questions until after everyone has presented. And also, please, if you have questions, um, let me know about them. Type them into the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen. I think lots of us have done Zoom meetings by now. But um, if you go to the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen um, and then type in to me directly. Again, my name is Lindsay Elizondo. Um, I'm going to be moderating and um, helping facilitate that process. So um, if I see your question specifically, um, uh, if you direct it to me specifically, I will definitely see it. It may otherwise get sort of lost in the mill um, if you just sort of submit it to everyone. Um, but I think our, we're going to have a lot of great questions tonight. We'll do your best to answer them. Um, and uh, pre-apology if we don't get to yours. Um, but I'm going to go ahead um, and uh, have a start um, here with uh, Dr. Carrie Morrison, um, so we can have as much time as possible. Um, Dr. Carrie Morrison has been in practice for um, how many years, uh, Carrie? 23. 23 um, fantastic years. And so we're so um, fortunate to learn from her and her experience tonight. Um, and she, so she's going to get us uh, going um, on the first part of our business of private practice uh, presentation. All right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. All right. So building and sustaining a private practice. So the first thing I want to say before we get started is um, sometimes this information, if you're not yet in private practice, can seem really overwhelming and um, people will throw up their hands and get discouraged. And, and I have to tell you, that's not the point of our presentation tonight. This is to kind of empower you and educate you and give you kind of the courage to step out there because being in private practice is not easy. It takes a certain type of mentality to run your own business. And we didn't go to school to be business people. Um, so what I can say is a long time ago, um, I was at Alliant, it was USIU at the time, and uh, we were talking about private practice in a class. And one of the professors said, you don't wanna think about private practice. There's just, there's just way too many therapists in San Diego. You just, people aren't gonna be able to make it. And I remember hearing that and, um, and I went and I was in my professional growth and talked to my therapist and she's like, Carrie, she said, never forget that there's always room for a good clinician no matter how crowded it is. And so remember that, um, don't get discouraged by what other people say if this is what you really wanna do. Um, the other bit of advice I'd give you before I start is, I had a coach a long time ago that said, don't waste your time reading about nutrition and physiology and how your muscles work and all of that. Your precious time is about training and, and consult the experts. Your time is what you are selling and that's your commodity. Don't waste it when you can pick up the phone and call somebody like David and get some advice that you need. Um, don't try and figure it out yourself. It's not what we're trained to do. So believe that it can be done and consult the experts. Those are the two takeaways. All right, 
Um, all right, so I think when you're starting a private practice, as I said, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for everybody, for sure. Um, and so what comes with a private practice is asking yourself a lot of questions. How do I feel about being a business person? Most of us didn't go to school to be in business. Um, how much am I worth? And really the reality is we're only as worth as much as our clients are, are able to pay. And so we may think we're worth $350 an hour, but if my client can only pay a hundred, um, I, I have to decide, am I willing to take that or not? Um, so how comfortable am I asking for money? Money tends to be a really loaded um, uh, issue for people. What are your issues around money? Um, do you come from a scarcity mentality or do you come from a mentality of if I do the work, the money will follow. And if my heart's in the right place, the money will follow. Um, so uh, you also get, sometimes people get buried in overhead costs and really for a business, the overhead isn't that expensive because you're not, you're not stocking product. You're not holding on. It's just basically you have to have walls and a few essentials and your overhead's not that expensive uh, when you think about space, um, space issues. Sorry, I'm trying to get this. There we go. Um, how do you feel about marketing and selling yourself? I mean, most of us, um, uh, no matter how long we're in, in private practice or we're in business, we have times where we, we're not sure we could sell ourselves. We have a lot of our own internal doubts. And so kind of coming to terms with some of those things and, um, and taking a look at it. And that's why I started out with, uh, with a psychologist in my professional growth hours. And I saw her until she retired last year. Maybe didn't see her often, but when things came up for me, that's where I went. Um, and so I think that's something that's important. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So then also remember, um, while private practice sounds great and you know fabulous, and I can say, well, yes, I'm in private practice. Also remember the other side of it. There's no company paid benefits. Uh, there's no health care. There's no paid vacations. There's no sick time. Um, you have to make a plan for all of those things, including a retirement plan. Um, but again, don't get discouraged. It's all manageable. Um, I think to be effective, you've got to be able to balance that business mentality with the desire to serve people. You have to have a healthy balance. If you're giving your services away, you can't make a living. You're not going to keep your doors open, right? If you're somebody who you count, you count your clients, you look at your clients as a dollar amount, that's not the, you know, that's not the right mentality either. So you've got to find a balance with that. So the business plan. So, and, and again, for some of you, this is going to be really basic and I apologize, but um, I think it's important to talk about anyway. So you want to think about, do I want to set out on my own and have just an individual, I'm, I'm a sole proprietor, I'm my own person. Um, which has advantages, or do I want to be in a group practice, which has some advantages as well? Um, the only thing that I would suggest if you're going to go into a group practice is know the people that you're going to go into practice with. Know their reputation, because remember, if your name is on a board with somebody else, they're going to put the two of you together, whether you're partners or not. So pick your colleagues wisely. Um, Where's, where are you going to locate your physical office? Do you want it to be in the middle of your neighborhood where you shop? Um, but do you want it to be 45 miles away where you have to look at a commute if you've got to jump in the car and see somebody quickly? Um, so think about that. Telemedicine, I think anybody going into private practice that's saying no to telemedicine is foolish. Um, I, many, many clients do not want to go back to in-person. Telemedicine has become so convenient for them and now that it's out there, I think you're going to find that a lot of clients are going to want that. Um, and you get to decide if that's how you want to meet them in the beginning, or do you want to establish an in-person uh, relationship with them before you do telemed? So those are some things to think about. Keep in mind that the research is showing that, uh, that telemedicine compared to in-person is showing just about the same success rate. I know when Dr. Thorpe from... Uh, from the VA was doing an in-person versus telemedicine. And I was one of the research therapists. That was one of his results is that 
Uh, and some people really prefer the telemedicine. So don't not do it because you're afraid of technology. Learn how to do it. Um, who are your clients, demographics? Your, your clients are gonna be much different in Normal Heights and North Park versus uh, Del Mar, Encinitas. Um, so think about what types of clients do you feel like you do best with? Where will your clients come from? You all wanna know, should I panel or not panel? That's like the million dollar question I hear. Um, how will you market yourself? And what about all your office forms, consents, et cetera? Again, consult the experts. I have used Ofer Zur, its last uh, name is Z-U-R. He does an amazing HIPAA compliant packet of all the forms you could possibly ever need in a private practice. It'll probably run you 75 bucks and it's well worth it. Practice startup basics. Uh, so consult a reputable accountant or accounting firm. Be this is before you get started. Figure out who's going to take care of my money and who's going to advise me. Um, I use the Bit Company in La Mesa. Many of their people over there are very uh, adept at working with um, sole proprietors or practitioners in uh, psychology. So very, uh, very good and reputable. The IRS. Um, you need to go get a tax identification number. In old school, we used our social security number. That is absolutely foolish at this point. So IRS, you wanna get a TIN, a tax identification number that will go on every uh, you know, bill, everything that you send. An NPI number, a nat uh, national provider uh, ID, is a, it's, you have to have that if you're gonna work with insurance companies. And really it's foolish not to have it anymore. Um, so get an NPI, no cost. Um, the CAQ registration, it's a data bank that's accessed by all the insurance companies. So instead of doing this, each insurance company, you know, trying to get on their panels, go into CAQH first, develop your profile. It takes a long time, but it's worth it in the long run. Because then when you call uh, Aetna and you say, I'd like to become a provider, um, they'll ask, do you have it on CAQH? Because that will speed up your process really, really quickly. So get a CAQH registration, I guess, at no cost. Open a business banking and savings account um, and have your own credit card for your business only. Don't mix your money. Um, the IRS audits are painful and expensive. I had to go through one fairly early on in my career in 2002. It was expensive. It took a lot of uh, time. And um, in the end, it cost me $4,000 and um, I went on my way, but it was really, really stressful. I hadn't done anything wrong. I just happened to get picked for somebody that they were going to audit. And so a couple things about that. Don't ever mix your money. I would get a banking and savings account in a separate bank from where you do your personal banking and keep everything separate. Um, Consult an attorney, make a professional will. Hopefully David will touch on that tonight. Um, I had the unfortunate uh, uh, job of a friend of mine died suddenly. She had no professional will in place. She had a huge practice. Um, she had a husband that knew nothing about the profession and he was getting calls from clients wanting to know where she was. And I happened to uh, share kind of office space. And um, so I ended up closing her private practice, but it was a disaster. So I would have been much better prepared if I'd been on her will and we had sat down and she said, this is what you can expect. Um, so I get a professional will. It's, it's really bad practice not to have that. In terms of business planning, so these are, again, you probably, for any of you that's already in practice, this is really redundant. Calculate your overhead expenses, your office rent. Do you want to sublease? Most of us back in the day, we would sublease a day from somebody who already had an office. It was a lot less expensive. We would build our practice up. We'd pick up another day and pick up another day until we were in our own office. There are places now that will... Uh, They'll do hour by hour. There's companies that'll do that. So that's kind of a way to go too. But look at what you, what you want to do. Do you want to sublease or do you want to get your own space?
I think right now, as we move pro, uh, post COVID, you're gonna find some office space much more reasonable than it's probably been in a long, long time. Um, so if you're thinking about office space, you might wanna start thinking about it now. HIPAA compliant telemedicine platform, that'll cost you probably 40 bucks a month. Um, I use Theralink, they, they are the tried and true that the VA uh, IT guy recommended to me years ago and it's really uh, efficient. I've never had a problem with it. HIPAA compliant electronic charts. I would not recommend doing hand charts. Um, the times that I, I have ended up um, having my charts uh, subpoenaed, um, they will go through those word by word. And so when you show up with an electronic re record, it's much more credible and there's less to pick apart. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't do those hand notes anymore. I use therapy notes. Again, it's, um, it also does a lot of other things. You can, your clients can uh, set up an appointment. You can send them all the pre uh, first session documents, all of that stuff. Um, you've got to figure your phone, web access, laptop, hotspot. Do not use your personal phone as, as your, uh, your practice phone. I know it's easier for some people. If you don't want two phones, get, get one of those Google accounts. Malpractice, health insurance, income protection, financial planner, accountant, salary, all that stuff's important. Um, show me the money, the paneling. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else is doing paneling today, tonight. Pitfalls of private practice. You're alone, you're isolated. Oftentimes you work too much, you work too late. You don't have real friendships because you're too busy. You're too stressed out. You've got all kinds of things going on. You've got a heavy workload. And sometimes that collides with your clients who also are lonely. They're going through marital issues, divorce. Um, this is a setup for disaster. And it's not just, I'm not talking just about romantic relationships. I'm talking about just boundary crossings. And these are the things that get us in trouble. Time, we run over time like I am right now. We run over time because we have a favorite client that we like. That we, ha we have a uh, place and space. We've got to look at um, our spacing and um, how late are we working? Uh, we've got to look at gifts. I know sometimes we, we turn a blind eye. Uh, we got to look at physical contact. Uh, no longer the days of patting a client on the shoulder or giving them a hug are, are those really safe anymore. Um, money, this is one of the biggest reasons people get in trouble is money, it's not clear. We're letting people slide three, four, five sessions and then we're collecting the money. And it's all of these things and self-disclosure. These things in and of themselves are not necessarily dangerous. What they do is they give the client the wrong message about your relationship. And then we get ourselves into a slippery slope. We don't wanna say anything. And if we have lots of other stuff going on our, in our lives, we're not as careful about our boundaries. And that will get somebody in private practice in trouble because there's no accountability. There's nobody around to say, hey, Carrie, why are you staying till 9.30 and seeing that client? What's that about? That was a lot of the things I wanted to kind of talk about. At the bottom of the pit is, is often a boundary issue. So accountability when you're in private practice is more important than when you're out in, in the world with other people because you can get yourself in trouble. You've got tunnel vision and you have no idea what's going on until you've stepped into the pit. Now, I know we asked you to do the impossible of condensing some of these. In, I mean, we could sit here for hours and hours about this. So, um, and I let everyone know that this uh, Carrie, you said that you were willing to make your presentation slides available after um, the presentation for, for people. Sure, and I think you have a copy of it, right, Linda? Yes, yes, yeah, I do. You can so, make that available to people. That's okay. fine. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Again, just a wealth sure. of knowledge. Um, so helpful. And uh, I know there we've got some questions um, already. And uh, we can dive into some of those topics that maybe didn't get uh, as addressed as, as you would like. Um, but we will go ahead and try to keep to the timeline. And we're going to um, go to Julia next. Um, Julia is um, also an early career professional, technically. <laughs> um, but she's been in private practice for 
um, quite some time as well and um, has a, a, a particularly uh, uh, important um, and unique insight here as she is a um, cash pay based provider. So we're going to be hearing from her. Just a quick disclaimer before I get started here. Uh, everyone's business and every provider's needs are different. So what I'm gonna share are my recommendations based on my opinions, and I have plenty of opinions, and my experience. Uh, so again, you know, every person has different financial needs, different business needs, but I'm gonna talk about my recommendations. Um, and if there's one thing that I can really hope that you take away from this quick 15 minutes, because I'm like Carrie, I wanna say so many things, um, is that I want everyone to remember that you are a business owner and it, the most, the best thing you can do as a business owner is to be a curious business owner about every part of your business. Even if you decide you want to delegate, right? You know, people get answering services, they delegate, you know, accountant stuff, know your books, know your finances, be curious about every part of it because you're likely to get taken advantage of if you don't. Um, and it's the best way that you can make the most informed decisions about your business. All right, so I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about how I grew my private practice because I think it's different than most. I actually started before I got licensed when I was a psych assistant. I knew that I wanted to start a private practice and at least when I was in school it was you do private practice later on in your life. That's what you aspire to do, right? And I thought, nope, I'm doing it now. And I really would recommend that because it is so much work. And if I think about starting it later on in life, I'm not sure I would have had as much energy to expend in doing it. Um, and it's, you also get to spend a longer time doing something you love. I would never do anything else. It is so rewarding and wonderful. So now I get to have a longer period of time in private practice. My niche is very specific. Um, and there is, there's a group of um, providers who will tell you, oh, you don't need to, you know, develop a niche, you know, you can be a generalist. There are so many providers in San Diego, and now that we are after going toward post-pandemic, uh, we now are competing with all of California, too. And so I think it's really important to make sure that you have a niche and that being a generalist is great. We all can treat a lot of different things, but really knowing who you are working with so that when you can talk to people, they know, okay, I'm going to refer to Jessica for this or Lindsay for this, right? That we're very clear about who we work with. And just so you know, my niche took a little while. Um, I had to kind of figure out who was in my office often and it ended up being those people who are ambivalent to change. And I think that's a really clear niche when I talk to people because I get all those referrals. <laughs> uh, so also when I started my private practice, I did networking lunches about once or twice a week. Networking is like, I think the dreaded word for a lot of introverted providers um, and also providers in general who are more extroverted too. I think it just can feel like a lot of work to do networking. Uh, but, and I, I know I felt that way in the beginning, um, but I think it's actually, it can be much more fun than you realize because it's getting to know your colleagues. It's getting to know the people that are around you that you can consult with, that you can refer to and getting to know them personally. And I actually have found that very rewarding. So I started doing that and that's how I built my practice on a cash pay basis is I got my name out. People knew who I was, they knew what I was doing. Um, and we would continually, I would make you know, a lunch with them in the beginning of the year and then I would meet up with them at the end of the year again and continue those relationships. I also said yes to uh, all networking opportunities. I did lots of random presentations all over the place for free. And that was great and fun and sometimes awkward. But again, all you want to do is get your name out there and you want to meet people. It's not just about selling yourself. It's also about knowing what the resources are out there for your clients and for you to use. Um, so I've never, as Lindsay said, I've never been in network with insurance. And I'm going to talk about insurance for a second here. I will not spend too much time on it, but I know it's a really touchy subject. And I think I would, it would be, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't kind of talk about the issues with insurance in our field in particular. So there are many reasons to take insurance and there are many reasons not to take insurance. I'm gonna talk about the concerns I have with insurance. Um, so we are paid extremely poorly compared to other medical professionals. 
I don't know if you guys have ever seen your other um, <laughs> doctor's bills, but they charge, um, they charge, I don't know, triple what we do. And they also can bill CPT codes. Those are the codes for insurance billing. They can bill multiple CPT codes within an appointment, right? So they can bill, you know, thousands of dollars in one appointment. And we're stuck with billing one CPT code in an hour, even though we do crisis management, we work with families, we do therapy, we do a ton of things in an hour. We are treated so differently in our profession in the medical system and specifically with insurance. Um, so it's important to be aware of that and think about that. The pandemic, in my opinion, has taught us our value or it has reminded us our value, I should say. Uh, because I, I'm sure a lot of you guys are in private practice, my referrals skyrocketed. I could not keep up. I had to hire a postdoc. I'm looking to hire someone else. I have an eight week wait right now in my practice. I, I've been doing this for six and a half years now. I've never had this kind of influx. And again, I'm cash pay and I'm not busy. This pandemic has shown us we are needed. We are helping people. And so insurance, in my opinion, needs to follow along. <laughs> I think there needs to be a shift. Um, and when you think about it, I'll let you know that um, I, I recently tried to panel with an insurance for the fun of it to see how much they were going to offer me. And it was less than $80 an hour. And I, and I think that what people forget, especially when you're starting a private practice, is that you have these overhead costs and you have 30% of your, of your income going to taxes. So if you're gonna take $80 an hour, are you actually profiting in that hour? Are you breaking even or are you actually losing money? And for each person you might have to, I mean, each person has different financial situations and you'll have to figure that out. But helping yourself understand what is the lowest you can take and what is it that you really need to be taking to be profitable or to make the income you want. Instead of, this is what I want to kind of, the main issue that I, that I wish we could all talk about more is that what we end up doing to ourselves and doing to each other, because I've had a number of people um, make comments about how I'm not helping people because I'm, I'm only taking cash pay. Um, you know, I'm not helping the, the underserved populations. I offer lower free, uh, lower fee cases. I do pro bono, et cetera. But I think instead of telling people who've worked really hard and going to grad school and taking out student loans, you need to lower your fee and lower your worth. We need to change the system. And if we stopped taking insurance and stopped taking these low rates, they would have no other option but to pay us more and to pay us better and the rates we deserve. So it's something to think about. And I really wanted to make sure I said that. But if you do decide to take insurance, my recommendation is go on one or two panels. Don't panel with all of them because almost everyone I know wants to go off them at some point in a few years and trying to go off of them all at the same time is complicated for a number of reasons. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so I think that's it. So now we're gonna start, um, let me see if you wanna go to the next one. So the starting basics. So I've had people ask about this a lot and people don't realize you actually need to register with the city. You can't just do all the basic, you know, get your computer set and go or your office and go. You actually have to register with the city. Um, and it's a very nominal amount. I can't remember now how much it is. Um, I actually found out, I, you used to have to go in person, now it's online. Um, and doing business uh, as, if you want to, if you want your business just to be your name, you don't need a DBA, but if you wanna create a name, you need a DBA as well, also another additional fee. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I completely recommend uh, EHRs for notes. They do uh, billing, um, they do billing, notes, super bill, all the, all the things you can imagine. Um, and they help you keep track of all of your finances year by year as well. So they're wonderful. The one thing I, I often hear from people is, well, which one do I go with? Because there are many. Um, most of them give you 30 day trials and I recommend just trying them because each, you know, you're going to prefer, you know, different things and, and to just kind of get comfortable with it. I have had to transfer from one to another, and it is possible to transfer all of your files, but it's a hassle. So I just recommend picking one you like to begin with and, and spend the extra time doing that. 
Uh, you want to get a website. It is 2021. We all need websites if we're in business. That's the way it works. Um, and you can do it a number of different ways. I actually created mine through WordPress. Uh, Word, WordPress has great SEO, also something to get familiar with. So I did it that way. Wix is also great at that. Um, and I did it myself, which again, when I talked about in the beginning, learning all about your business from the ground up, I think is really helpful. Now I have someone help me manage it a little bit, but I did that myself. There's also this thing called therapy sites, which is a great website. And they basically create websites for you. You pick like the formats you want it on. And I think you pay about $45, $50 a month, something like that. I pay about $15 a month for my WordPress. So it's more expensive. And the difference is there is with therapy sites, you don't own your domain name. And so, and you can't really go and edit your, uh, your website as easily. So there's more work when you create your website from the ground up, but it's, you know, there are also benefits to doing that better SEO, less money, more accessibility to editing it yourself, et cetera. Uh, HIPAA compliant email. I use G Suite. I love it. That's great. I think it's like five or six dollars a month. Very cheap. Office space. Um, so also like Carrie was saying, uh, I agree that you want to, if you don't have a lot of clients or if you have none, you don't want to rent full time. You want to rent by the day or the hour at first. Uh, you want to keep your overhead low. So business months. For me, I actually have not gone and gotten an accountant. I have done it differently. I have a bookkeeper and um, a bookkeeper and a small business tax professional. And for those two people, they help me in tremendous ways. So for those of you who don't are not familiar with bookkeeping, uh, most people often use QuickBooks. And I did that myself. I did my own QuickBooks. Uh, for about two years and then hated it and was like, this is not something I, I want to spend my time doing. So it again, took me a few years to find a good bookkeeper, but it's been invaluable to me. So why do you want to do your books? You want to do it because you can organize and track your tax deductible expenses. This is really important because it saves you money at the end of the year. If you can track all of your deductible expenses, it is very, very helpful. It also makes your taxes easier if you have a good bookkeeper or you're doing good bookkeeping on your own. And your tax person will love you if you do that. Uh, and it also, you'll have the ability to track all the aspects of your business's health. And then that allows you to make informed decisions about how you wanna do that or how you can meet your future financial goals. Um, also, um, credit card system that has low transaction fees. So I actually, so I don't know how much you guys know about all of that, but in terms of Square, it's a really high transaction rate. Um, and Ivy Pay is a very common one that therapists also use. Um, very, it's like the same transaction rate, if not a little bit lower, but it's pretty similar. I went to my bank and asked what they could offer me and it's like a whole percentage lower. So it's important to really sit down and figure out, you know, what, how do I want to do this? How can I save money? What are the areas in which I really want to do this? Right now, I feel very solid with my credit card system because now that everything's been virtual, everything's credit cards and I have really low transaction fees. So that worked out really well. You also want to use a bank that has been business benefits as you guys grow. So I'm the really annoying person that went, <laughs> went to every single bank in San Diego, I think, and sat down with the business banking and said, what can you offer me? Um, you know, if I add a credit card system with you, if I have a certain amount of money in my bank account, what do I get? And I ended up going with Bank of America, actually. And I don't have any, um, I don't have any charges every month in my bank account. Um, I have no, I have very low transaction fees on the credit cards. I have cash back deals. I have great, great deals. And I think that it's important to also pay attention to those things as well. A little also, over a minute left, Julia. Oh, oh, no. Crap. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Let's talk about post-pandemic. Okay, so go back or stay virtual. And my feeling on this is I actually, my second business is I have office spaces and I rent by the hour um, and the day to therapists. So I see this from both perspectives, one as a provider and one as someone who rents to therapists. Office spaces are not going away. Um, lots of people still want to come back. In fact, this week I got three calls from people saying they want to be in person. 
So I think it is just going to be a mix of things. Um, some populations do not do well with telehealth. Mine does not. I work in substance use. I work with people who are actively using. I cannot smell the alcohol on them. I can't see their eyes as well. There are so many things that telehealth does not do for me in those, in those populations, those sessions. Kids, kids also struggle with telehealth, right? So there are lots of reasons why we should stay with telehealth. I think we're probably gonna do a lot of hybrid. Some clients are gonna be out of town and wanna do you know, a Zoom or whatever, and then you know, they wanna be in person the next week. I think offices are gonna stay around and my recommendation is to have an office that you can rent by the day or the hour so that if you don't wanna be there consistently, you at least have access to one if you need it. Um, and then also we have an increase in demand after the pandemic um, and to really also be thoughtful about the fact that you can access clients all over the state, but now clients are leaving and going to different states. And we also have to be careful about state laws and you, how you do that as well. Um, so that's something else to pay attention to. All right, done. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you so much. And was this also uh, something, Julia, that you wouldn't mind sharing? Yes, um, that's totally fine. Slides? Okay, great. Also fantastic. Um, and uh, again, impossible task to try to condense this into 15 minutes and we can try to expound on some of these things absolutely afterwards. So we have one more um, brief presentation to go and then we will launch into the Q&A section and uh, just a heads up for people who are um, just joining, please uh, chat questions directly to me, Lindsay Elizondo, as I'm the moderator. So, and that way I will be sure to see your questions. Um, so we will now go um, to Mr. David Leatherberry and his... Um... While you're pulling it up, let me just say, I, I feel like this would be an excellent introductory sort of session before moving into day-long breakout sessions because there's so many issues getting just kind of teed up uh, that I find myself wanting to respond to everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a good thing I'm on mute. Um, <laughs> um, and so Lindsay, do you have the, do you have a stick or do I? I do. So I'll, if you just want to let me know, I can. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and move. Okay. Okay, so uh, what I've tried to do, just based on my experience doing these presentations, is I, uh, you know, lawyers are paid by the word, at least we're accused of that. So um, I've, I've learned to uh, just try to take a few slides and, uh, and we'll try to unpack them. So let's go to the next. Um, the first thing I want to just touch on, I mean, there's so many issues, great, great things that have already been said here. Um, and I, I, you know, I, 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 I felt like there was just you know, so many issues we could just sort of take on. But um, I want to touch on networking. I think of all the of all the things that came up, networking has so many uh, valuable impacts. One is, as we talked about, it certainly is a way you grow your business uh, without maybe thinking about it just by being on this call, uh, the number of people that are on this call, you're networking. And it does a couple of things. One is uh, it does build a business. Um, I am fortunate in that I don't think I've ever intentionally advertised. Um, I, and I did reach a point where for a number of reasons I chose to pursue what I loved. And uh, just because of interacting with people, uh, it builds. And so that's a great thing from a business development perspective, but without realizing it, you're also protecting your liability. You learned in graduate school, I'm sure, or in some uh, CE presentation, that uh, in order to, um, that, that if to, you know, you, you learn about negligence, professional negligence. That's why you have insurance, and people worry about getting sued. I often hear people come up and say, "Can I get sued?" And I stop listening right there. I don't really care why they're thinking about it. The answer is always yes. You can always be sued. So how do you protect against that? Um, and you learned in graduate school that a negligence claim is based on a standard of care, a breach of the standard of care, uh, resulting damages, and then a complicated concept called causation. But that standard of care, people learn by kind of rote uh, sort of learning that, well, it's the reasonable therapist under the same or similar circumstances. That's the reasonable therapist standard. Well, the question is always out there, who's the reasonable therapist? 
And, and I encourage you to look on the, uh, just the, the screen here and look at all of the people and no one of you is the reasonable therapist, but the collectively you are the reasonable therapist. This is by, by interacting with others, you are identifying what another psychologist, a reasonable psychologist would do under same or similar circumstances. So whether you're networking, whether you have a consultation group, whether you uh, meet with other individuals, you are at that point testing and learning the reasonable therapist standard. And the more complicated or dicey the issue is, you know, you just add more faces. So uh, welcome to the collective. It sounds like a very modern thing. Uh, we, are, we are collectively the reasonable therapist, except not me, I'm not a therapist. All right, so let's talk about disclaimer here. Lawyers always have to say this, don't rely on um, what anything I'm saying as legal advice, just as when you go to a cocktail party and somebody comes up and talks about some dark thoughts they have, you know, you, you don't give um, therapy during a cocktail party. And, and so this is just educational. I'm required to give this advisement, um, you know, as uh, so moving on, I think. So let's go to the next, next slide. All right, so my role here, uh, much as I'd like to talk about so many other things, is to talk about benefits in, of uh, incorporation. And this comes up a lot. People who are thinking about going into practice for themselves ask, do I need to be a corporation? Um, and the answer is always, it depends. There are a number of factors. The primary are that a corporation can uh, limit certain types of liability. It doesn't make you immune. It doesn't protect you from certain things. Um, it also uh, gives you certain tax benefits, and we're going to talk about some of these uh, as we go forward. It, it can give you access to credit. One of the first things that happens as soon as you become a corporation is you get all kinds of mailers offering, you know, they'll file forms for you, um, they'll uh, offer you uh, loans, um, and so that's just a way of accessing funds if you need it. It helps you reduce self-employment taxes, and that's something you always want to discuss with your CPA or tax planner. Um, and it offers some, some fringe benefits. And one of the key ones here is um, it, it opens up something called a SEP IRA. When you, are, when you just walk out and you hang up a sign and start offering therapy, and I think of Lucy from Charlie Brown, and you have that little stand by the side of the road that says, uh, therapist, five cents. Um, it, wages have improved a little bit. Uh, as uh, Julia mentioned, uh, healthcare panels are now paying about 15 cents. But it's, uh, you know, you, you're operating as a sole proprietor in that context. Um, you don't have to incorporate, you don't have to do anything. You're operating as a sole proprietor and there's certain tax deductions you can take. But becoming a corporation means that you are, uh, formally getting recognized as a separate person. The corporation actually has existence, it has certain rights. Um, and in doing that, in becoming a corporation, you can now pack away up to 25% of your gross income into a, an IRA. Whereas if you're an individual, you're limited at, I believe it's around, uh, it's been so long, I, but less than 5,000, it's around 25 per person. Um, Whereas the cap for a SEP IRA, if you're a, a, a corporation, is 57,000. So what happens is it makes more sense as, you, as your income goes up and you start reaching that six figure level, the tax benefits and what you can put away into your own retirement plan um, becomes compelling. But just starting out with a few clients, you typically don't need to become a corporation. You can be a sole proprietor. Let's go to the next slide. So there are limitations that I mentioned. So one is that people often hear that a corporation protects you from liability. It protects from some, it protects you, say for example, if there's a slip and fall in your waiting room, the person can't sue you personally, can't go after your individual assets, that million dollar yacht you have parked on the bay. Uh, but they, it, you know, they're limited to your insurance. But the corporation cannot protect you from liability arising from claims based on your own individual acts of malpractice. And so if somebody comes in and you, you fail to do a suicide assessment and there's harm as a result, 
your your corporation doesn't stand in between you and that claim. That's why you have uh, professional liability insurance. Um, typically, insurance comes in the one million, three million, uh, one million per occurrence, three million aggregate, um, or two million four. Look at your policies policies carefully. Where people are doing higher risk uh, practices, they tend to go for the higher amount. More often though, the real issue is making sure you're not trying to save money by getting a low uh, board coverage policy. And that's something we can talk about later. But uh, the, the insurance comes in different amounts for board coverage. And uh, that's an area where you typically wanna have at least 50,000. Um, but where it does come into play, where it does offer protection more significantly is if you decide you wanna bring on uh, associates, uh, psych interns, and uh, or registered psychologists, and you provide supervision. By uh, uh, automatically, an employer is what's called vicariously liable for the acts of its employees. Which means, if that same person comes in comes in with a suicidal thoughts, and your a psych associate fails to do the self harm assessment, and there's harm as a result, they can sue the psych associate individually but they can't sue you individually. They can sue the corporation as the employer. Uh, the employer is automatically liable for the acts of its employees, but in that case, you're protected. So if you start bringing on people who work for you, then it becomes more important to be a corporation. It also will help shield you from claims arising from employment liability claims, that's harassment, wrongful termination, um, that kind of thing. Um, just be aware that if you do start a corporation, California uh, is gonna get its cut. Uh, and so there's a minimum $800 tax. Sometimes people get the idea of forming a corporation at the last minute. They just learn about it over Thanksgiving and contact me in December and say, I wanted to file this year. And what that means is your corporation isn't gonna earn any money during 2021, but you'll still be liable for the entire minimum tax. So typically you want to be thinking about this at the beginning of the year. Also, there are costs and filing fees, maintaining corporate acts and procedures, um, which are the formalities we'll talk about in a second. Let's go to the next slide. So corporation, forming a corporation is governed by particular laws. Oftentimes you'll read things and somebody will offer to do it for you, an accountant will do it for you. And frequently I see where somebody has formed a general corporation or a stock corporation, um, or they think about an LLC. Let's be clear, both of those are prohibited. You cannot be an LLC, you cannot be a general corporation. Let's go to the next slide. So under California's Moscone Knox Professional Corporations Act, um, if you are licensed and you're providing professional services, you must practice as a professional corporation. That is a specific designation, completely unrelated to S Corp or C Corp, which may be terms you've heard. Those are IRS tax designations. California requires that you be a professional corp. It requires a specific filing. It requires that all officers, directors, and shareholders in the corporation must be licensed. You can't have a partner uh, who is a good friend uh, and a, has business savvy, but they're not a healthcare provider. Um, if you're gonna be a psychological corporation, at least 51% of the control must be held by a psychologist. Let's go to the next slide. So there are key steps in forming a corporation. It begins with forming or filing the articles. Again, specific to psychology, they designate that the purpose of the corporation is for the practice of psychology. It's going to authorize specific shares. Um, one thing people don't realize is where is that corporation going to be in this telehealth age where in many, for many practices, real estate is less important. Um, people are looking for alternative places and that corporation has to have an address. Um, it can't be a PO box. Uh, so you can think about some of these rental uh, places where you lease space virtually. Uh, there are alternatives there, but you don't want your home address, obviously, because it's going to be a public filing and patients will show up at your door. Uh, corporate name has limitations under the psychology licensing law, must denote the practice of psychology, containing words like psychologist or psychological, and it must have words denoting corporate existence, such as corporation, inc., corp, that kind of thing. 
Um, after you file your articles of incorporation, you're going to file a statement of information which identifies the officers and directors, and that statement must be updated annually. Let's go to the next slide. Um, because if you don't update it annually and you get behind, the state can suspend your corporation, and operating as a suspended corporation is actually unlawful. Um, and there are a number of problems that can come from that. You can have a corporate book. And when you go online and you go to like LegalZoom, you know, they make a big deal out of your corporate book and your corporate stamp. And those are vanity items. There's no requirement of any particular book. And the stamp is something you can get at a, a, a stationary store. Um, but what you need About is something to hold. Thank you. What you need is something that is going to hold your important papers. So those are your bylaws. The minutes of the organizational meeting of board of directors that's where you alone are sitting at starbucks and you contemplate what uh, you know that you're going to become a corporation it's going to um, issue stock and have, there are going to be limitations on that stock because it, as, since california is a community property state if you were to die or, uh, or divorce that uh, your property including your corporation could pass to uh, uh, a spouse and that would be in violation of the uh, Moscone Knox Act. So there have to be written limitations on your stock certificates and in your bylaws. And your corporate book will also cover your annual meeting and, and uh, corporate minutes. Next slide. Um, after you form your corporation, you're gonna get your EIN. We, uh, you already heard about that, it can be done online. You go to a bank, get your bank account using your EIN. You're going to do a tax designation, which has to be within 75 days of, of uh, getting recognized as a corp. And then you have to get your state and local licenses, including your San Diego business license. And then if you do business under any entity, under any name other than your personal name or the exact name of the corporation, and I mean exact, then you're required to have a fictitious business name. Otherwise, you can be violating both legal and ethical. Uh, issues in terms of um, false representation. And then you're going to get your identifier. Next slide. Make sure that you, do, once you become a corporation, you already heard about having separate business accounts. You want to make sure that everything you do is as the corporation. So all of your leases, contracts, practice forms, they're going to be in the name of the corporation, not you personally. Next slide. So what we do, um, and you already heard, for example, you know, with practice forms, you know, that's something we try to do, but it, it, it's difficult to, to just because of the time involved, because a lot of the practice forms that are out there, people are pulling off the internet. Um, you can get them in packets, but they're frequently outdated. They frequently use the federal standard and not California law. And so in some key areas, they're inaccurate. Um, I've read practice forms that talk about, you know, the, uh, how you can break confidentiality based on a threat to property, which is not accurate. Um, and so we can perform, we provide that kind of guidance. Uh, we, uh, you know, obviously we can help you set up a corporation, uh, professional wills you talked about, but we do a number of other things that won't take your time with that now. And that's it. How'd I do? Did Fantastic. I get it in? Yeah, that was just, just there. So <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, just fantastic presentations here. Um, and I know I've, I've got a number of questions that have come in. Um, and yeah, just a lot of, a lot of um, appreciation for everyone's presentations. Really helpful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to utilize our time as much as possible here and transition into the Q&A, starting with some of the questions um, uh, that were sent in ahead of time. But I did, there was one quick question um, that came in um, for um, Carrie, just to rename the professional that you had mentioned who provides the intake and consent forms that you use. Over Zur, and I'll, I'll just put it on the chat here. Uh, oops. Last name is Z U R. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So I, I did hear uh, the other day he retired. Did uh, he? Somebody had he has he has sold his business though, so you can still get forms uh, through that business, I believe. 
We addressed this uh, to uh, a real extent, but just wondering if there's any other things to mention for this question from Sarah that um, is, what trends are you all observing regarding completely virtual practices and post pandemic, can we expect this to be more common? Um, and any business implications, pros and cons of having a completely virtual practice? Anything else that hasn't been addressed maybe? I'll, I'll jump in and say that I think that it's obviously gonna be more common, absolutely. Um, but I also think if you choose to do a virtual practice completely, you are limiting yourself in terms of who you can take on. Not everyone wants to be virtual. And not every population should be virtual. Um, even if they start off that way, they may want to come in person at some point. Um, I've had a lot of um, teams actually requesting to come in to build rapport in the beginning and then go virtual. So if you're going to go completely virtual, you will limit who you can take on. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but I do think that's something to be aware of. You know, I, I wholly agree that virtual is not going away. And I've had people call from different places and they're looking at kind of restarting the, the work, the, the office environment. And, um, you know, because they, they're still not thinking of virtual as a kind of a temporary interruption. Um, and they're afraid that healthcare providers, or excuse me, healthcare plans uh, are going to kind of pull away and no longer reimburse uh, virtual or, or telehealth. I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, tele we, we've been talking about telehealth for a long time. Physical medicine is has moved and moved into telehealth well before behavioral health. Um, it, it may kind of swing and adjust a little bit based on what Julia is saying in terms of the preferences and isolation of the therapist. Uh, it, it's difficult to be fully telehealth. Some people are using it now to expand their borders. Uh, there is a lot of discussion regarding interstate. Um, we're nowhere near yet adopting the side pact or, or interstate compact for psychologists. Uh, California has too many uh, kind of hurdles in place. Um, but at the same time, the law has become more flexible so that as long as you're licensed in California and your patient has some contact with California, defined contacts, you don't have to be in California. And so um, more and more, we're looking at a reality where the therapist is in uh, Kansas or Guadalajara, and the patient might be in New York, but they're both California residents or, or licensed, and one's licensed in California, and there's significant contacts that the patient has in California. So we're dealing with that, but telehealth is, is just continuing to expand um, and um, creates border issues that uh, expand the practice. Another question um, also related to the pandemic, um, would it be legal to choose to only see patients in person who have already been fully vaccinated? Take that one. Uh, just that is, that's almost a daily question now. Um, and so, you start off with the premise that a psychologist is never required to see a patient and put their, their, themselves in harm's way. Um, if you think about the duty to transition care and offer referrals, um, if that patient is threatening, uh, assaulted, whatever it may be, it's always been the rule that you don't you, you can terminate and walk out. You don't have to be at risk. And so the virus doesn't change things um, in that regard. Um, and we're seeing this more and more where uh, in the physical health side, you can require employees uh, to, to be vaccinated. Um, you can ask a patient, you know, you, you have to still maintain uh, safety measures, you know, your distancing, your uh, uh, hand washing, hand hygiene, gloving up, and uh, you can ask about vaccinations. Um, and limit your practice to their to face to face to face practice to those who have already been vaccinated. You also have a duty of care to your other patients. And so even if you've been vaccinated, the science yet hasn't established that you can't carry the the uh, the, 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 the virus. So um, the, the the limiting issue that keeps coming up is you want to make sure that all of your other ethical principles aren't affected. Are you being fair and equitable? Are you discriminating uh, based on factors other than disease? And that's where it becomes problematic. But if you set a policy that says, um, I'm 
returning to work on a limited basis for those people who one can main, you know, who can uh, who have been vaccinated and uh, who will continue to, to observe safety precautions, uh, you can do that. Um, next question, um, David, you, uh, you spoke to this to some extent, but I thought it might also be helpful to address um, a question from Mary. What is the best type of business to structure, business structure to have if I'm a solo psychologist, you know, potentially other than incorporating? May have misheard. I started to jump in on that one. Was that, I don't want to take it out of turn. Um, Right, so the best business structure to have if I'm a solo psychologist. So it, it's fact specific. Um, a couple of things, you know, the, the, the two big kind of uh, things to look at first. One is income. Um, you know, it, if you're just starting out and you have only a few patients, uh, it may not, be, may not be worth it. I mentioned that in the presentation. The add-ons though are, there are a number of soft factors that come into play as well. Sometimes people ever since undergraduate years um, have been dreaming of a sole pr uh, practice, a solo practice. They have a name already picked out. They have kind of an image, a mark, a uh, brand that they've picked out. And it may be that you want to preserve that. For some people, having the anonymity, being able to stand behind the corporation, that's important. Uh, there are a number of sort of individual factors. And sometimes people also just think of, they feel like there's more esteem associated with being, you know, uh, Dr. Elizondo Psychological Corporation, uh, as opposed to just being a sole proprietor. On the other end of the spectrum, there are people who practice their entire life um, and certainly are earning well into, you know, six figures who stay uh, as sole proprietors. And so what you want to do is have a discussion about your preferences, your risks, um, how you're mitigating risk, and certainly the economic considerations. I'll just add something. I started, oh, Carrie, am I cutting you off? No, you go and then I'll go. How's that? Right. I started off as a sole prop. Um, and as soon as I hit six figures, I went and incorporated into an S Corp. And I did that because I was paying so much money in taxes. And I realized that I, you, you basically don't pay. So I don't, I don't know if you guys know this, but when you're self-employed, you get your tax at a much higher rate than anyone, than your personal self. And so you pay a lot more money. And so since I've been incorporated, I've been incorporated for two years um, and I should have incorporated prior to that. Um, I save about 10 to $15,000 a year on taxes. So once you hit a certain amount of income, it's actually very helpful financially. And that's exactly what I did. As soon as I hit six figures, then I went from a sole to a to an escort. So yeah, I think it kind of depends. And that's where a, a good accountant comes in where you can go and sit down and, and talk to them, an accountant and uh, an attorney and talk about how it impacts liability. And importantly, when meeting with the accountant, oftentimes they'll just say, well, you know, they'll give you a general response pin them down and talk about, all right, looking at my particular tax situation and bring in your last year's returns, maybe the last two years, how can you save me money? What specific deductions are you going to be able to get for me? Um, you know, Julia mentioned one big one, which is just if you're a sole prop, you're going to be paying a much higher uh, tax rate than when you become an employee of the corporation. But the other is that, that SEP IRA, which is huge, it can become limiting once you start to take on employees and there are some legal considerations so that you don't now have to have that same IRA for your employees. Uh, but that being able to put away 25% of your income as a corp uh, is a great catch up strategy uh, for on an IRA. I'm wondering if maybe we can pivot to a couple insurance related questions um, to get some of that covered. So um, Carrie, this might be uh, some for you. Um, let's see, this comes from Dana. Uh, I have a couple of insurance related questions. Is there a different process in applying for paneling when moving from a group to private, um, I imagine solo practice? Also, if you're declined as a provider from an insurance carrier, what can you do about it? So I think quickly what I'm going to do is, of course, I want to finish my presentation, but 
I think quickly what I'm going to do is do something that will help because it sounds like some of you don't really recognize some of the insurance things. And I have a simple graphic right back here. Um, here's the payment sources, right? So your fee for service is what Julia talks about is that she's a fee for service practice, right? The client pays out of pocket um, and she establishes what her own rate of pay is. Um, she, she can provide her people with a super bill. So if they do have insurance, they can send it into the insurance company, but, but the client's chasing the money and Julia's not have to, having to chase the money, which takes a lot of time. So if you look at um, the insurance panel, sorry about that. If you look at the insurance panels um, in network, right? And this is what Julia is talking about. It's terrible. It's probably at one point it was United Healthcare was at $70. Um, and that was just a couple of years ago. And TriCare, TriWest was around, one of the better ones was like 120 maybe. And so if you get on a panel, the, the pluses are, you're gonna get a steady stream of clients. And Julia's advice I think is great. Pick two, pick the ones that pay the most because they will provide you with a steady, steady stream of clients while you build your practice, right? Because getting clients in the door is the hardest part of starting a practice. So once you have your name out there and people start to recognize the name, then, then you're fine. But I would recommend if you're gonna do panel, pick a couple of them and uh, recognize a provider agrees to a negotiated rate. So if you apply to get on a panel and they decline you, it's usually because um, it's impacted, too impacted in that zip code. They don't need any more providers. Um, so you can try again. Um, just because you've been denied once doesn't mean they're gonna deny you again. I was trying to get on Blue Shield years ago and every month I would send them, back then it was sending them a letter, every month I would bug them and finally I got on it. So um, another way to do it is if you're a psych assistant and you're working in a practice where um, your, your, uh, your psychologist is on, on panels, oftentimes they will allow you to join that panel when you're attached to that psychologist. When you leave the psychologist, they, some of the panels will allow you to stay on that panel. You don't have to wait three years to get paneled. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's making sense to people. And then your outside of network provider. So again, um, you can also have a practice where you're not on any panels. You're like, hey, I'm worth more money than that. I am not willing to do that. You can still see people that have insurance as long as they have preferred providers or POSs. You take the money up front, you give them a super bill and they chase the money from their insurance company because you get tied up in chasing that money. And as much as you can eliminate doing that, then, then do it. Um, did I answer the question? I think, I think that answers it. Can I, um, can I to add something real quick? So Carrie answered this very well. And when she was talking about um, insurance companies not accepting you, a lot of times it has to do with your zip code. And so a lot of times therapists will go to where all the therapists are, La Jolla and Hillcrest and whatever. And that actually can be a downfall if you're looking to take insurance because you want to go to the areas where there's not a lot of psychologists and you'll likely get paneled better or easier, I should say. Great, I'm hoping that that sort of answers Dana's question, which was, um, she was, she's been getting declined from insurance panels um, and is there anything else she can do? Has she asked why? Ask why? Good, good question. Um, I think it might be helpful to take another insurance related question kind of while we're on this, uh, this deal um, from, uh, I apologize that I'm probably mispronouncing this, but from um, Tara um, says, I've heard some concern within the therapist community that once things go back to normal, that insurance companies may not reimburse for telehealth sessions if it is possible for us to know this, is that accurate? And given this, what considerations should psychologists who started their telehealth only private practice during the pandemic take into account? Um, as many don't have a physical office space clients can go to. So 
David answered that a little bit. He, I mean, he, am I speaking mm -hmm. on your behalf, David? You answered that, right? <laughs> you said Always they're not, feel not going away. <laughs> Um, I, well, no, no, I don't think it's going away. It certainly is a concern. It's very difficult, you know, especially once legislation is created. And in this case, the, you know, it's an executive order uh, compelling insurers in California uh, who were subject to Department of Managed Health to offer the same reimbursement as they did uh, for, you know, traditional inpatient. It's, it's going to be very difficult, I think, for insurers to peel that back it's or and more accurately health plans to, to peel that back um, can they it yes it's conceivable but telehealth is doing is just gaining momentum um, you know there certainly are, are situations where i think for individual patient circumstances individual providers the in-person format works better um, but uh, I, th I think that the, you know, one of the things we're seeing uh, over the past year is, is such a demand for uh, psychological services. You know, I, I think it's, I don't know what the numbers are in terms of historically, but anecdotally, you know, certainly in the past 25 years, there's never been demand like this. Uh, you know, people all over the state are looking for psychologists. I keep hearing people say, if you know of somebody looking for work, I need another psychologist. And a lot of this is attributable to telehealth because people can access it so much more easily, as well as having all of the stresses and job issues and you know that are going on. Um, so, I think it's it's perhaps a good concern. But if I were looking at diversifying my practice and take this, you know, I'm not a psychologist, so take it for what it's worth. Uh, I would focus more on diversifying diversifying my practice by moving out completely away from healthcare or uh, from uh, managed care uh, by developing private pay. Uh, it's, it's harder to get that started. It's good to have it. it it's going to be um, an economic buffer against the suppressed rates that you get, are going to get through managed care. And uh, one of the things, God forbid, if there's ever a board action of any kind um, and the board imposes discipline, which, you know, they publicize it before they make any decision. We just went through that today where, you know, they file an accusation. And even if you win, you know, so today we actually, you know, rare case where you win, that accusation is still out there. And so insurers look at those things and then you're having to fight for whether or not you can stay on the panel. And they'll oftentimes limit uh, or remove somebody from the panel. And, and so, you know, I'm often in a position where I'm talking to somebody about diversifying their practice and developing a cash pay base. I think having that kind of diversity will buffer against a lot more issues than trying to read the tea leaves as to what managed care is going to do in the future. Great, I think that addresses uh, a number of questions um, here. Um, and maybe kind of along that line, uh, along that line um, is from Mario. Uh, how did you, uh, sorry, sorry, Tani, Tani, what is the best way to start networking with private practice practitioners? And I can do a little self plug for the ECP committee. We tend to um, provide about every other month some sort of event like this, and normally during non COVID times, an in person large networking event where things like that are available that has been. Um, much less available because of COVID and I think people are tired of online sort of networking events, but that's one thing. But maybe Julia, or if you'd like to speak to this and kind of how you found people to network with to help build that cash pay system. Sure, so uh, because I specialize in uh, substance use uh, disorders, I contacted other providers who did the same work. That's how I started off. I contacted rehabs. I went to the rehabs. I networked with people that were in my specialty. And then every time, and so I, I love eating. So I would do lunch and that's what I love. And also I think <coughs> most times people like getting together over food and hanging out and talking coffee, things like that. Um, and so then every time I would meet with someone, they would say, oh, I know someone that you should really connect with. And then boom. And then before I knew it, I couldn't keep track of all of the people I was supposed to meet with, right? But that was sort of how I started it. And I think for the most part, 
you know, private practice clinicians, like they're saying, are pretty isolated. So if you contact people, no one's going to say no, or I think it's rare that people are going to say, no, I don't want to talk to you. So, you know, if need be, cold, cold calling is certainly okay as well. Julia, so let me add one quick thing. Something you mentioned a little while ago that, you know, you, I, I don't know if, um, I, I, I guess I don't want it to slip by, and that is the power of volunteering. Yes. Um, you know, giving your time away gives you tremendous leverage. You know, you, you see that in, a, in an unhealthy way in clients, right, who want to ingratiate themselves in order to create this sort of interdependence of some kind. I mean, that gets way outside of my field. But, you know, somebody told me many years ago that the, the power of volunteering, where you can demonstrate your skills, create, um, you know, make yourself useful, it gives you actually tremendous leverage because you're, you know, you, you, you set your time, you set your hours and you're building, um, you're, you're making yourself importance, you know, arguably making yourself dependent or someone else dependent on you. Um, and so that when you leave, you find that it can become, you now have a source of, what, if it's not direct referrals of patients, it's people who know people. And so I, I think that volunteering, it should not be underestimated. I also decided to be on a bunch of committees with SDPA. So I chaired the ECP committee for two years. I'm on the government affairs committee. I'm on the addictive disorders committee and I'm on the San Diego Psychological Association's board. So um, that has been invaluable for me because in my current networking sphere, I'm usually around people who are working with addictive you know, behaviors, addictive disorders um, or colleagues around my age or year in terms of uh, graduation. But when I joined the committees at SDPA, I met a lot of uh, psychologists who were in later, their later career. Um, and that was wonderful. They started retiring, they started sending me clients, um, and just also wonderful relationships and, and, and you know, networking and building friendships and things like that. So uh, also get involved in your professional organization. I really think it's important to do that. Um, this is an interesting next question from Monica. Uh, I would like to hear advice about managing online reviews from clients, um, especially with the use of our, our websites and things like that. That's an interesting one. What was the question again? I missed part of it. Sure. I would like to hear advice about managing online reviews from clients. <laughs> so this is a David question, I think, but I'm just going to say that you can actually disable reviews on Facebook, and I've done that. You can dis you can, I do not have a Google, um, I do not have a Yelp page, um, and I know that sometimes people can create them for you, and then you're screwed. <laughs> you can, it's hard to really take them down once they're created, um, but I've been lucky. I check, I Google myself a lot. There's no Yelp page for me. Um, and uh, also, on, I think a Google search, you can disable the reviews as well. So I really do as much as I can to not allow reviews. That doesn't mean they can't pop up or be created, but I do as much as I can to, to mitigate that. And I know that when they are up, you really have a struggle getting them down and you just sort of have to let it go. So It's, it's very difficult to get them down. Um, and, and part of it is it's just a new world we're in. Uh, where people on an impulse, uh, you know, they walk out of your office angry and within five minutes with their phone, they can leave a bad review and they can make a board complaint and make your life living hell uh, just while they're angry. And then the next session, they come back and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I did this. But yeah, now what do you do? Um, there are, so first let me say, there's there's an article that was in the last uh, CPA uh Psychology Magazine uh, that was done by uh, the uh, Caudel firm, uh, uh, Sabati, I believe. Uh, so take a look at that. Uh, this is not my area of expertise, but <clears throat> there are a couple of things. One is, you know, just not being, not, not set, you know, limiting your online presence and not inviting, you know, reviews through, through, things like Facebook or, or, or Yelp. Um, but when it is there, I mean, I think it's a very good point to always be checking your, you know, Googling yourself and seeing what's, what's out there. Um, but when you find it, there are uh, uh, 
there's some, a couple of strategies that I've, I've seen. Some have employed, you know, if it's a current patient, uh, essentially saying, hey, I noticed that this is there. You know, can, you, can we talk about it? Why, why did you feel the need to do it? And I've, I've had some situations where um, a therapist has engaged the client and the client has sort of changed their, their, their review. Always talk, get counsel before doing that because that's dicey, especially if there's a broken relationship uh, and the person has now left their office. Um, there, are, there are services out there that are reputation defenders, basically, that will put positive content on the, on the uh, uh, review sites in order to push negative reviews down, uh, which is another strategy. I've seen some people try to do this at the front end, and this is another sort of dangerous technique, where they try to get the patient to agree to never do that. You know, they put it in their consent by accepting therapy with from me. You'll, you'll never, ever say anything negative about me. One, it's not enforceable. Arguably, it's unethical when you try to get a patient to agree to something that's unenforceable and in violation of their rights. Um, and it's manipulative. And the board would look at it as sort of putting your own interest above the patients. I mean, they're just, it's fraught full of peril. Um, but there can be language where you at least try to encourage somebody as a condition of therapy with you that if you have negative you know if there are concerns um, talk to me you know it's how you it's your interaction with that patient it's often said that a therapist's best defense uh, in any situation is the relationship you have with your patient because it's a it's a relational uh, uh, it's a relational uh, what do I say service um, and <clears throat> you know you, you can become your best advocate on that but Oftentimes I find myself, I mean, I have to tell somebody, look, it's, um, you know, it's important that you just recognize that that's out there. I think people don't listen to it as much uh, as we fear. And the couple of cases I've had where someone has really been mortified by a negative review, but when we look back at it a year later, it hasn't had any impact. There is another strategy um, that some will use where they'll it's very common in healthcare to do client satisfaction or patient satisfaction surveys. Um, and it's maybe a good idea anyway to get feedback from patients about how they're, you know, how, how they view their therapy going. And in some cases where somebody has, you know, a very, very positive read, um, the healthcare provider may ask them or say, you know, would you be willing um, to, to post a review? It's, it's important, and again, get consultation before you do that because you can never, you can't be using a patient to further your own objectives. And the board can look at that as being manipulative. So it has to be a very soft approach where it's very voluntary by, uh, by the, uh, the patient. It's a little bit of a untested uh, theory. And so again, before you do that, um, I would get counsel. Can I, I'm just gonna, so many uh, people bring this up and say, well, I wanna respond to the review and say, this person wasn't my client because that's also what happens is I don't even know who this person is and they reviewed me. Um, and I, from I'm under the impression, we cannot respond. Is that correct, David? So are you absolutely prohibited from responding? No, I mean, the problem is, is that obviously confidentiality issues limit your response. And so you can't say anything that either identifies the patient or, or can lead to their being identified. Um, and so sometimes people will inadvertently say something about the interaction that allows the person to be you know, identified. And so if a, if a patient you know, leaves their own name on the Yelp review for you to respond to it in any way that acknowledges a patient relationship is, is gonna be problematic. And the other two is there are certain ethical standards um, in terms of um, you know, furthering the, 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 the practice. I mean, there are these, the board sometimes looks at these very soft, uh, when you look at the first part of the, uh, uh, the, the ethics, uh, um, professional ethics put out by the APA, and you have these aspirational standards about do no harm, do good, um, you know, your relationship with the profession. The last thing you want to get is in a, in, is in a, pardon the expression, in a pissing match with a former patient on, on a, in a public forum 
And oftentimes, and I've seen this happen, where even if you're trying to take, trying to avoid saying anything specific about them, it's just the response makes you look like you're getting into a petty dispute with somebody. Um, so taking the, uh, the high road, uh, always take the high road, and oftentimes the better high road is just not respond at all. But if you're going to respond, there are times where you can, you know, so long as you don't say anything that identifies the person or any specifics of therapy. And in, in that regard, people will say something general about how in the practice of psychology, patients can sometimes get frustrated about the lack of progress. This is a, a risk um, you know, that is discussed uh, at the, you know, the beginning, at the onset of therapy. And if anybody were to have questions, I would encourage they talk to their therapist. I mean, it's something very bland and generic and in no way takes the issue on head on. Um, next question is for Julia. Um, how did you address reimbursement and advertising as a psych assistant? This is from Mario. Mm. Uh, I networked. <laughs> So that's how I did it, right? I mean, you can't have your own website. Um, so I networked and I came to um, SDPA functions and I knew people, I went to school here. That was how I did it. So when, when I had psych assistants, um, what it was where I would get them clients is people that wanted to, uh, wanted services, didn't have health insurance and they, they couldn't pay my fee, then I just shoveled them over to my psych assistant. And we had, there were probably four or five clinicians in that building. And so that person became the person who could see the, those people that were only able to pay lower fee. So um, get the word out. If you're a psych assistant, you're working for somebody, get the word out. Um, contact uh, places like San Diego State, they're always bombarded with referrals that they can't hold them all. And so if, if a psych assistant's willing to take a, a you know, a lower fee, um, they'll, you'll get plenty of referrals. Same with the Gay and Lesbian Center, is if you're willing to do low fee um, and start out as a psych assistant, then you get your name out there. Remember the best source of advertisement is a happy, satisfied customer or client. And so that's a way for you to get your name out there. And then as you get your name out there, your, 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 what you're charging goes up. You just can't walk out the door and go, okay, I'm worth $250. I've got my, my uh, li license and people are going to pay it. Um, it's, it's pretty rare unless you're, you come with a lot of, um, you know, backing already. So build your practice. I think what Julie has been able to do is, is uh, phenomenal. And, and it's really, uh, that's, that's amazing. And I've seen practitioners able to do that in town where they're a cash paying practice, which is fabulous. Um, you just don't walk out and charge $250, $300 an hour and get it right away. Doesn't mean you're not worth it. I, uh, my postdoc that I got, um, I hired her in June of last year, I believe, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I increased my rate in the pandemic as well. And mm -hmm. I gave her a rate that was closer to my previous rate. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so that, you know, we, again, kind of like Carrie was saying, if someone couldn't afford my rate, they went to the postdoc. Um, but I filled her practice with 18 to 19 clients a week within four weeks. Nice. Yep. And that's the pandemic. And that was straight from my referrals. I wasn't even advertising her. So I do think things have shifted with the pandemic. And I think it's possible to build a practice pretty quickly that way, actually. Next question is, what's a good way to find people who are renting office space by the hour slash day? That's, I do that. <laughs> Julia. Julia. I have two suites. I have nine offices, um, two waiting rooms, a kitchenette. Um, and then I also have helped multiple colleagues of mine do their own. So I have a colleague up in um, oh, near Carmel Valley. She has a suite. And then I have another uh, colleague up in Encinitas who does that. So if you're interested, feel, re feel free to reach out to me and I can connect you with people. I know SCPA also has um, a classifieds uh, or classifieds or, or rental spaces available um, 
web page on their website that lists available office spaces. So look at the San Diego Psych Association website for that as well. Okay, next question. Um, let's see. Uh, from Sarah, wondering if Julia can expand on what questions she'd recommend asking banks while setting up the finances slash credit card systems. I mean, I think anyone can jump in on this too, but I think for me, I just sat down and I said, what can you offer me? What are the perks? And, you know, they usually have the pamphlets and they give you all the levels. Um, but the things you want to sort of look at are, you know, are there perks if you add credit card systems with them, the merchant services? That's definitely a big one because you get fee, you get monthly fees with banks, right? And um, if I got that, I have no monthly fees um, with my bank accounts, which is huge. Um, with their credit card services, you know, do you get uh, money back? Right now, I was able to switch it and because most of my, instead of like using gas and getting money back for gas, I do a lot of... Um, internet services and things like that right now with our practice. I say a lot of my expenses are around that. So I get cash back on every month based on that. So just looking and seeing what the perks are. Also, once you keep a higher um, amount in your bank account, um, they give you all kinds of extras, things that I don't even even like use. I think they offered me free QuickBooks online now. I can do that, um, but I have a bookkeeper, so I don't use it. So just, you know, ask and think of all the different perks you could possibly want. And, and uh, the other thing I would say is, is that I originally thought going to um, smaller banks, they might give me more. And I just, that's not the case. You're muted there. Um, we have a couple questions about names um, of, of naming your corporation. Um, so probably for David, one is if you're a solo, from Christina, if you're a solo practitioner, can you still operate under a different name, even though it's not a corporation? And um, related to that was a question, well, maybe if you wanna answer that and then I'll find the other question about names. So, start out, there, there are a couple of rules that apply that you have to um, have honesty in advertising. And uh, that's both a, a, a statute law under the Business and Pre Professions Code, and that it's considered to be an unfair business practice to be deceptive in advertising. Um, and it's also an ethical, uh, uh, actually, it's, it's a part of the psychology licensing law, I think, in the uh, Code of Regulations, State Regulations, that you can't, <clears throat> you can't misrepresent, misrepresent who you are as a psychologist. And quite literally taken, that law becomes problematic for people who just decide to take, who get married and take a spouse's name. Is that now, you know, from when they're practicing, they're licensed under one name and they maybe have adopted another name. And, and maybe, you know, even if they're not, if it's not a, as a result of a sort of marriage, it, it could be just because they go by a nickname of some kind. And <clears throat> to be strictly accurate, you have to hold yourself out and practice under the name of your licensed. And so however, you, you know, if it's, if it's Michelle J. Jones on your license, then you are Dr. Michelle J. Jones um, for the purpose of all patient interactions in the name of your practice. To do anything different um, to, then requires, what uh, Julia alluded to this, a fictitious business name designation. And that requires that you file an application, you pay a fee, and it has to be renewed typically every five years. Now, that, that's going to be true even if you're a sole prop and you just get out of school and you just get started and you want to, you know, it doesn't mean necessarily that you change from your, your, your own name and Julie, I'll pick on you. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you're going from Dr. Julia Rosengren to the Feel Good Institute. Uh, it could be just going from Julia Rosengren to Julia J. Rosengren. Uh, that is, if it differs from the license, it requires a fictitious business name statement. The same is true if you're a corporation. And sometimes people don't really think about that when they put the name, when they file their articles of incorporation. And I've seen some very, very long um, names of corporations, which just don't fit on a letterhead or in a business card, I mean, it just gets really awkward. 
And so to, to abbreviate it, to, to go from corporation to corp, you're technically now a fictitious business name and you would have to do that same filing. It's not like there are a lot of fictitious business name police out there, um, but it does come up sometimes when you're trying to get paneled with an insurer or uh, sometimes if for whatever reason the board's looking at you for some other reason, they might take an issue with it. Um, but the, just keep that in mind that the rule is that anything different from how you're licensed or how you're incorporated requires a fictitious business name. Okay, and I think that that pretty much answers the other question about names. Um, let's see. Um, um, Zora was wondering, um, is the registration with the city um, different from incorporating? And could you please explain the difference? Yes. Um, so the city, that varies city by city. It's really another way of the city trying to, um, you know, bankroll its services based on corporations practicing or businesses practicing. So anytime you do, you, you engage in a business. Um, and uh, so, so my wife for a while was a part-time piano teacher and learned after I think five years of doing this, that her seeing a couple of kids and charging 20 bucks an hour or something, it was pretty nominal. She now owed the city back, you know, back licensing fees. She got a letter. Um, because the city eventually will get wind of it through your uh, IRS or your state uh, franchise board filings. And so it's, it's basically a tax. They call it a, a, a license. Sometimes it's called a license. Sometimes it's just called a registration, but it's basically a tax. The corporation is what creates this entity, which literally is, under this, as far as the law is concerned, it's a person. It has rights. Uh, it can vote in some certain ways. It has free speech. We've talked, we've learned about that over the past few years in terms of uh, you know, political speech. Uh, it, has, uh, it has the right to sue and be sued and be represented in court. Uh, it, uh, it's, there are a number of aspects of it. Um, and it doesn't exist until you begin the process by filing and uh, getting recognized as a corporation. You often hear terms like S Corp, C Corp, those actually, it's, it's kind of a shorthand referring to IRS tax treatment. It really has nothing to do with the corporation. Um, but uh, in order to maintain that corporation, you yourself have to respect it, which means uh, going through the formalities of maintaining minutes and it doesn't have to be exhaustive. Uh, I say it sort of lightheartedly saying, you know, you can be at Starbucks and you just, all it means is keeping up to date, pick a few times a year, where you're just going to reflect on has your corporation done anything? Did you enter into a lease? Did you decide to open a new office? Um, and, uh, and then you just enter, make a, a two line entry in your corporate book. Uh, and that preserves it because the risk is, I didn't talk about this, but the risk is that if you don't do these things, if you don't maintain separate bank accounts between your personal account and your, and your business, if you don't go through these formalities, if you don't keep up to date with the statement of information each year and pay your corporate taxes, then the state will disregard, it's what's called disregarding the entity, which means that you know, for one example of it, worst case scenario is if you ever are sued, and, uh, and I've defended uh, a case, uh, we had a case in Washington, D.C., actually, where a guy was very, very young man, very, very successful, but he just loved to spend money and mix personal accounts and the business accounts, and the court disregarded the, the corporation, so he was then sued personally. He didn't get to benefit from that, that corporate existence. So long-winded response, but yes, two very different things. I just want to say that about the corporation or incorporating too, is that I think people forget that incorporating costs you money. So not just the 800 that we talked about, but um, now when I file taxes, I have to file a personal tax return and a corporation tax return. And it's well over a thousand dollars, maybe $1,500 just to do taxes. Um, and that's a write off. Right. I mean, that's a deductible expense mm -hmm. for your business, but, you know, everything becomes more expensive when you're a corporation. So it really does matter that you do it when you're making the money that it benefits you to do that.
Um, next question comes from Connie um, for Julia, but I think Carrie, you could chime in here too. Um, can you describe slash explain how you include sliding scale and or pro bono clients into your practice? So what I do is, it's on my website too, is I actually go and pretty much explain why I'm private pay and I'm very clear about that. So if anyone has questions um, and I say that I have three revolving spots in my practice for low fee or pro bono cases. And um, so I'm just very clear that that's how many slots I have in my practice at any one time. And as soon as one becomes open, I take on someone new. Newsflash, I take on more than that usually, but it's what I advertise and it's what I feel comfortable with saying. And it's also an easy way to say, I don't have an opening. If someone calls, you know, I don't have to feel very uncomfortable. I take three slots, you know, I have three slots in my practice. Unfortunately, I don't have anything open. Would you like me to keep your name? I can call you when one opens up, et cetera. Um, I usually always like to have at least one pro bono case. It's just, it's, it makes me feel good and I like doing it. That's how I've done it. So, so I'm sort of old school. Remember, I, I started, I was licensed in 1998. So, um, so things were different back then. And I, my practice has always been about a 95% insurance driven practice. Um, you know, at the time, I, it, you know, it was, I was the, I was the sole provider and I needed to make money and it was a way to get started. And then I just never really um, I think that there's, I, I think as Julia talked about earlier, it's a, it's a personal decision to make how you want to, how you want to run your practice and, and everybody's different. And for me, um, running an insurance driven practice, it provided me some, uh, some stability to a certain extent, provided me some coming from more of a scarcity mentality background. It provided me with, um, with stability, I think, and a, and a cash pay practice. Um, I think, uh, I think it takes somebody that's, uh, gutsy and, and takes a risk and really, um, you know, anybody that's been able to do that, my hat's off to them. I just, I didn't have that kind of mentality going into it. And so rarely did I have cash pay clients. And, and when I did, I charged them the same you know, the same amount I charged the insurance company. It was just a matter of, I actually got paid what I charged, but probably 5% of my practice has been a cash pay practice, which, you know, you, when you look at it, I think right now, I think, um, I think it's a good time to, to branch out and go cash pay because we are in tremendous demand and, and people will pay that. Um, and so I think in a perfect world, it would be great to, all of us leave the insurance companies alone and, and, and uh, you know, be able to, to determine what it is that we think is a fair price to, to charge our clients. Um, to me, the insurance companies are organized mafia. Yes. It's, it's yeah, they're the organized mafia. They're, they're a necessary evil. So, oh. Yeah, uh, um, another thing is, is I know at least I, the way it was for me when I worked in agencies is that you would have like a sliding scale thing, like how many people do you have in your uh, family and how much income? I don't do that. I say to someone when they're gonna come, you know, they want a sliding scale fee or a lower uh, rate, what can you afford? That's what I ask people, what can you afford? And we go from there. If it's below, like for me, I typically won't take below $70. Um, for a low rate, because again, I look at my overhead and all of that, and mm -hmm. I figure out what what is going to work for me. I don't want to be paying some for someone else's therapy, really. Um, and so, uh, you know, I will ask them, and if we're close, if it's above it, you know, if they're like, I can pay ninety, great, you know, or if I can pay seventy, great. And I go, I do it that way. Um, I don't ask for verification of income. I'm already choosing to lower my rate. We just agree on it. The other thing is, is that um, I really would recommend people telling. <laughs> Uh, their clients that this is an adjusted rate for three or six months, pick a, pick a time frame, And at that point, we will reevaluate your lowered rate. Yep. Because if you don't do that, you are stuck with a lower rate forever. And you're not stuck with it, but it becomes so hard to then adjust it. 
And so you always want to upfront talk about lower, you know, even pro bono cases, I do that too, because you always want to reevaluate. Someone could get a job, someone could come up, you know, all this money all of a sudden, and they're still not paying you for therapy. And you're like, how do we discuss this? So if you can just do that ahead of time, it makes it a lot easier. Great, great uh, advice there. Um, next question, and then uh, just so folks know, we end at eight, so I'm going to be able to take a few more questions here. We still have a lot that we just won't be able to get through. I'm sorry. Um, we will be able to um, make the presentations available um, after this, um, and otherwise, um, I'm I'm don't want to speak for our panelists, but perhaps some of them might be willing to, to speak or answer some of your questions outside of this time, but also just there's been so much information um, that they've been fantastic to share with us tonight. So hopefully, I think a lot of them already have been um, answered. Um, but next question comes from Jamila. A uh, quick question for David Leatherberry. Does an S Corp need to have an NPI too? Or is that a recommendation? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the NPI2 is uh, unrelated to actually corporation formation. I mean, uh, that's in the slide because those are typical steps that uh, if, if you are going to be completing, for example, super bills or you're wanting to get on a panel, then you're gonna have a separate NPI number uh, from your individual NPI number. And so the one for your corporation is an NPI2. But an NPI2 or NPI number of any kind is not required to be a corporation. I think that was my shortest answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and who you also had when um, uh, uh, from Jean, um, kind of a two part question. If there's anything else that maybe hasn't been addressed in this uh, presentation, what are some common legal mistakes that you see early career professionals in private practice make? without realizing it? Um, and is it necessary to get a lawyer when starting private practice? We have how many minutes? Of, uh... <laughs> yeah, just, just squeeze it in there the last few minutes. So uh, let me tell you a little bit. Uh, so I'm a little bit different than most, uh, I think most law firms out there, uh, in, in part because uh, I started working with psychologists very deliberately. I used to work with a national uh, you know, a, a very, very, very large law firm. Uh, it's in every, you know, pretty much every state. Um, and walked, you know, I was having dinner one night with others, some other healthcare lawyers. At that point, I was representing a hospital and the subject of rates came up. And the other two lawyers were working with big LA firms and they were charging respectively 1300 and 1400 an hour. And uh, it had already become apparent to me, and at that point was just mind-blowingly, painfully apparent, that so much healthcare is delivered through the solo and small group space with people who cannot, any, you know, who just don't have access to, to legal uh, help uh, or guidance. And so they beg, borrow, and steal. They get stuff that they find, they, they get from their neighbor. And there are just a lot of, there's just a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and that people are using unwittingly, you know, and, and you know, I bet you, you know, with most uh, of the uh, HIPAA, uh, you know, notice of privacy practices that each, each of you are using, I could probably look at it and point out, you know, a couple of errors that are there because they, they overwhelmingly borrow from HIPAA, the federal law, and they don't reflect California law. And one specific example of, of a difference is HIPAA allows uh, 30 days for a healthcare provider to respond to a record request. California requires 15. And there are uh, financial sanctions that can be imposed if you, if you miss that 15. And so uh, this is just kind of one of the things. So I decided a while ago to try to just help support psychologists. It's just various reasons that space made more sense. Um, and uh, it's, it's because I came out, I did about 10 years of advocacy for the homeless and mentally ill in the acute setting. I did probably 8,000 civil commitment hearings. And, um, and so it, to me, it just made sense. And so what I try to do is support what you do. I can't do what you do. I can't help the people you help, but I can support you. And so I do a lot of giving away, a lot of pro bono and encourage people that when they're starting out, 
it doesn't hurt to just pick up the phone. And people oftentimes, you know, tell me that they've waited so long to talk to me because they're, they're, they're just resistant. You know, they have this notion of what it is to talk to a lawyer. I try not to be scary. Um, you know, I don't think, I, I don't think I am. Um, and so it helps. And, and I don't, uh, you know, if there are questions, we'll talk about them. I encourage everybody here, if you have questions that have come up, give me a call. You know, I'm not going to turn around and send you a bill. Uh, we'll spend some time, we'll, we'll chat about it. Um, it does help uh, to, to start that relationship because there are a lot of things that can be kind of nipped uh, or, or sort of avoided early on by having a discussion that later on can become worse. Uh, you know, so in terms of frequent issues that come up, um, just know this, everybody, you know, I, I oftentimes put this chart up, there are sort of four possible outcomes in any patient encounter. One is good care and a good result. That's what everybody wants. But the reality is it doesn't happen every day. In fact, it's more rare than we'd like to, like to admit. Um, sometimes there's good, good result and actually below standard of care. And that's where you get lucky. Um, people make mistakes every day. And it doesn't mean you're going to pay, you're going to lose your license or get sued. I mean, the, the reality is people make mistakes. And, and the, the trick is to stay within that spectrum of what's reasonable under the circumstances. Um, I won't trouble you with the other two possible outcomes. But, you know, I, I just, I, I think the more you engage with each other, the more you network, the more um, you, you know, involve, be involved with law and ethics seminars, um, reaching out, I'm happy to chat with you. Uh, there are some people who decide they want to talk to me enough that we decide, you know, we have essentially a, a retainer and they um, call me regularly and we just, it's just a few minutes here and there we talk about things, you know, subpoenas. I think probably the most common area though where people get into trouble is, is you know, managing records. Um, and that's a whole discussion by itself. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but always feel free to give me a call after we talk about it. Yeah, and that's always a great um, part of the SVPA membership that um, you work closely with SVPA and, and we um, have uh, some access to you as members. So thank you very much. Um, all right, everyone. Well, I want to um, be mindful of our time and of our fantastic presenters time. Um, and just thank you so much to Carrie and Julia and David. Um, for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, this was really rich. I know there's we could be here for hours asking so many more questions. So um, everyone, this was recorded. Um, you should get um, either an email if you registered for this event um, with the link. It will also be sent out through a subsequent SVPA email blast within probably the next week or so, and it'll be added on the um, uh, likely the SDPA's YouTube channel as well, and so will be made available to others. Lindsay, I just saw a question pop up that I, I need to address because it okay. contains some perhaps dangerous, mis I, I may have misspoken or misled some, somebody. Okay. So with regard to telehealth, practicing across state lines, you must always comply with the licensing laws of both the state where you're licensed, California, and the host state where, where the patient is residing. Uh, it's, and it's driven by where the patient is, not where you are. Uh, so if you're in Kansas and you're working with somebody in California, you, you know, and you're licensed in California, you don't have to worry about Kansas. But if your patient is in Texas, you need to comply with Texas licensing laws. Yeah, yeah good, good note about the host state and therapist state. All right, well, everyone, thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and hop off. Um, and uh, again, let me know if you have any questions. You can send me an email. Um, my email was in the original um, uh, advertisement for this event. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. But otherwise, thanks again to our lovely presenters. And everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Liz. Thank you. Thank you.